Welcome back to Video Land. Today we're going to shift gears. Up to this point uh, in the course, we've been talking about individual business strategies. Now we've talked about a lot of companies that are operating in multiple business lines, but typically we've talked about companies and a single business line within that company. Today we're going to focus on instead companies that are operating in multiple business lines and to see why they do that. This is something called a diversification strategy. Our textbook does one of the best jobs of any textbook I've ever read of explaining diversification strategies in chapter six and giving you some of the underlying reasons why they do and do not work. Uh, unfortunately, the textbook does something else. It lumps the topic of mergers and acquisitions and alliances in with the idea of diversification, and that's not true. So even though in this uh, week's cluster we'll talk about M&As, you're going to see when I speak about those, it's not always about diversification. It's sometimes about uh, other things. So uh, take the grade of this textbook chapter, particularly the first part of the chapter six, the latter part of it, uh, not necessarily the greatest. In a lot of other leading textbooks, you'll see an entire chapter dedicated to M&As and an entire chapter dedicated to alliance strategies. Although, frankly, I think entire chapters is probably a little bit of an overkill. So it's either too much or too little. Let's roll on. When we talk about corporate strategies, we are focused on the question of what business should we be in? Uh, and, and kind of an extension of that is um, why do those businesses belong together? You're going to see me emphasize this point uh, a couple of times because this is something you should be constantly thinking about with the diversification strategy. Why do these businesses make sense under one house as opposed to split into standalone businesses? And then once we've identified that businesses perhaps could be profitably operated together, we have to talk about how they are managed to uh, get the advantages of that diversified strategy. And then part of that should be how big should we be in each of these businesses? Should we be a little bit in this business or should we be all in in this business, so to speak? All in not meaning that uh, it's the only business we do, but we go into it in a big way. Sometimes this has to do with geography. Do we want to be in certain businesses and certain geographical markets or not? So there are a lot of questions that you tackle when you look at a diversification strategy. Uh, you all know I love Dilbert. I apologize that this cartoon, for whatever one I scanned it, it didn't come through very clearly. But it introduces the, the most popular word that you will usually hear uh, when we're discussing corporate strategy, and that word is synergy. So in the first frame of the cartoon, uh, Dogbert is telling Dilbert that I'm going to uh, open a bar, and then in the second, he's going to say, I'm going to sell overpriced putrid art. And you think, why do those businesses fit together, art galleries and bars? And then in, in the last frame of the cartoon, Dogbert shows you his version of synergy, which is, I'm going to get people drunk, and then they're going to overpay for this horrible art. So there's the synergy. I make money off of them from drinking, and I make money off of them because they um, pay too much for the artwork. Uh, obviously, I don't care too much for the alcohol reference, although I, I think it kind of puts it in an interesting concept or construct that if you want people to make horrible decisions, this might be a way to make it happen. And so with that very negative teaser about synergy, let me bring this home with a couple of examples you're going to be familiar with to point out this idea of operating in different markets because it makes sense to do so. What you see on this screen is two pictures to remind you of two different types of businesses. The first is a very popular business in Wichita Falls, landscaping businesses. Is, uh, in, in the summer months, you see so many uh, trailers with tractors and lawn equipment on the back as they zip around to all the different yards and cut the grass. And then in the bottom right photo, you see this idea of Christmas lighting. Uh, when we moved to Texas uh, first in 2005, this idea of putting all these lights along the roof lines, I went, wow, it's beautiful. Uh, and then we priced it and went, wow, that's really expensive. We're not doing that. But it's incredibly popular. 
Now, here's the, uh, the reason that I have these two pictures on the slide. A lot of people that do the landscaping business also do the Christmas lighting business. When I was teaching this class at the undergraduate level in Lubbock, I had a young man that was putting himself through college by running his own landscaping business. And I had a hunch that maybe they might be involved. And I wish I had a camera running to capture the conversation that he and I had. Because I said to him, hey, do you, do you know anybody that does the uh, Christmas light business? And he goes, yeah, I do. I went, really? Why do you do the Christmas light business? And what he gave next was literally unprompted, a textbook discussion of synergy and some of the, the economies of scope that we're going to talk about later. He says, well, uh, A, I have the time because I don't cut much grass in late November, December, and January when you're putting the lights up and down. B, I already have a lot of ladders because I trim trees as a part of my business. C, I've got a trailer that I haul my equipment around with. And D, and very importantly, I have a customer list of people who, by the fact they have me cut my yard, have already indicated that they're willing to pay other people to do stuff around their house. And that is a great description of synergy and economies of scope. Here's the next example. And this is one where their society has changed so much that it's almost hard for y'all to see it, uh, unless you're m uh, my age or about 15 years younger than me. Uh, what you see in this picture is something that you're very used to seeing. You see a Walmart and you see a gas station because you're used to seeing gas stations at Walmart. What not was this way? Um, you didn't start seeing, I, I looked it up, Walmart put its first gas station out of the store in 1994. And if you still go to some of the original Walmart stores that are uh, 20 plus years old, you'll see there's no gas station in the front of them. And this has become quite popular. So you see United Market Street now has gas stations in front of them. Uh, a lot of other grocery chains all have gas stations in front. Well, why would that be? What does it take to have probably a good gas station location or a good gas station? You're selling a commodity, a commodity product, gas, so the product itself doesn't matter. Well, let's see, you would want uh, a lot of customer flow by you on a daily basis. You'd want a convenient location. You'd want it to be easy for people to get in and out of your gas station. Well, what matches that almost perfectly? Grocery stores. Uh, and you can see how well this fits, for example, with Walmart, where they're the one price or the low, pli low price leader that people come and they save money because they don't have to drive around to the gas station, they just get their gas right there. Didn't used to be this way. When I was young, you had gas stations, period. You had convenience stores, and believe it or not, the 7-Elevens of the world, they didn't have gas stations in front of them either, because or gas pumps in front of them either. There were gas stations, and then you saw it come into the convenience stores, and that made sense, and now you see it into the grocery stores. And so you see that many of these grocery chains have done a diversification strategy where they now sell fuel in addition to groceries. So here is the fundamental question you should always ask about a diversification strategy. What is it about these businesses that make them worth more together than they are separately? And I had a student that wrote an ST paper couple of classes ago that just brilliantly highlighted this question. They wrote about Pepsi. And Pepsi is a great example of a diversification strategy because they run their beverage division, which is obviously the colas, but they have a lot of beverages other than colas. But did you know that Pepsi also owns Frito-Lays? And there's a lot of synergy between the beverage division and the salty snack kind of division, not the least of which is the products tend to be sold in the same places. Uh, sporting events, convenience stores, obviously uh, grocery stores. So you can see where there would be a lot of synergy there. In fact, it makes so much sense that Coke has its own salty snacks division too, doesn't it? 
Trick question. Coke does not have its own salty snacks division. Coke does strictly beverages. To be sure, lots of different beverage lines, but Coke is beverage only. So if you look at the two, meta, two major soda manufacturers in the world, Coke and Pepsi, one is diversified, Pepsi, one is not, Coke. Now, over the past several years, Coke has consistently outperformed Pepsi. And it was ironic that the student had this ST, and it was a great ST. Uh, and the day after that presentation, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that people were calling for Pepsi to spin off its Frito-Lays division because it was holding back the beverage side. And so that fundamental question, why are they worth more together? then they would be separate. And then I've already teased you with this idea of synergy. So the basic concept of synergy is that you would add 2 and 2 and get 10, or at least 5, so that things, when they put, they're put together, they're greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, that's the theory. Sometimes it actually works that way. Uh, I like to put it this way. Synergy is the 20th and 21st century equivalent of searching for pirate's treasure. A lot of people talk about it. They're convinced it's there. Many people go searching for it. Few people find it. That's not to say that synergy doesn't exist. It says that synergy is not a given. This stuff is not easy. A lot of people think it's there, and they don't find it there. And in the M&A chapter, I'll give you the greatest example of where people were convinced there was synergy there, and it just didn't happen. So here's the theory about diversification strategy. I've talked about economies of scope, and I have a um, slide a little bit later that are gonna, we're going to detail these economies of scope uh, a little bit greater. But there's this idea that we can either use our core competencies in multiple business lines, or we can share activities across multiple business lines and gain efficiencies uh, through that. Or it could be that by going into a new business, we will gain a competency that will help us in our existing businesses as well. Then you have, so rationale number one, economies of scope. Rationale number two is market power. And I'm going to give you some illustrations of this uh, on a later slide. But if you think of Porter's Five Forces, the simply stated market power is an attempt to take each of those forces and manipulate it in a way that when you're done, it's more favorable for the profitability of your firm. And again, I'm going to give you some examples of that a little bit later. And then, um, even though we talk about them like they're individual, they're, they're a sliding scale, then you get to this idea of a very unrelated diversification. And this is where a company has a, a whole raft of businesses underneath it, but they don't really have anything to do with each other. And, and it's all about the ability of corporate headquarters to manage those individual businesses better than they could be managed if they were alone. There's no attempt really to share activities. Uh, there's not an extensive attempt to share core competencies. Uh, it's just we know how to run these businesses better. So let's launch into the discussion by giving you an example of a company that runs a diversification strategy. If I were to ask you about Honda and say what comes to mind, I'm convinced the first thing you would say is automobiles. You would think of uh, the Civic, the Accord, the Pilot, the CRV. And then if you thought a little bit lo longer, you would probably think about, oh yeah, Honda owns Acura. That's their luxury brand. Okay? And then as you think a little bit more, you go, uh, doesn't Honda sell motorcycles? Yeah, they do. And uh, Seems like Honda has a marine division where they sell uh, outboard motors and make jet skis. Yeah, they do. Honda also makes generators. They make lawnmowers. Now, what's common to all those devices? 
an internal combustion engine. And one of the things that's said about Honda is that it has a core competency with internal combustion engines. But now, Honda, believe it or not, launching its own business jet should be on the market um, in uh, about 2014 to 2015. Interestingly enough, you would think, well, okay, internal combustion engine, well, okay, that jet engine, yeah, that works. They're actually getting the jet engines from GE. So that's a hard one to, to fit. Well, guess what? Toyota is diversified too. Yes, they build all the cars, but Toyota also builds pre-manufactured housing. Unlike GM, Chrysler, Ford, the U.S. car companies, who really aren't diversified into any other market significantly, although you could make the case before they were into some financial diversification. And then you compare it to the Korean car manufacturer, Hyundai, they're in a ton of businesses. Uh, car manufacturing is certainly a big part of their business, but they do ship manufacturing and lots of others. So you can see there are a lot of companies out there doing diversification strategies. Uh, this chart is not from our textbook, but I think it does a great job of explaining the two dimensions of the economies of scope. I'm going to try to use my uh, little marker here and steer uh, my little mouse, and I'm not having any uh, good results with it, so I'm just going to quit. On the horizontal axis, you can see where it talks about the sharing of core competencies, uh, and this is the corporate relatedness, and you can see the more that we share core competencies, uh, the more synergy that that creates. The vertical axis is where they talk about sharing activities, and then you can see the top right uh, quadrant is kind of nirvana, where you're both sharing activities and you're sharing core competencies. And let me illustrate that uh, off of this chart. And let's look at a great example of a very diversified company, Procter & Gamble. Now, Procter & Gamble fits in the uh, consumer products market entirely, but they're in laundry soap, batteries, shaving products, cleaning products uh, for your home, lots of different things. Can you see a sharing in core competencies? Sure you can. You can see that they use certain probably common cleaning chemicals that work in laundry soap and in floor wax and uh, in bathroom cleaner. So they have that sharing of core competencies. Then they have a, another real sharing of core competencies called marketing because P&G is a master of branding. And so the skills that allow them to brand some things well should allow them to brand other things well, too. Then you get into the vertical axis where it talks about the sharing of activities. Well, if you think about it, P&G has a lot of products that have paper in common. So they can go out and uh, maybe do certain paper processes that they're going to use both in paper towels and in diapers because there's commonality in those activities. It could be that you have manufacturing plants that are co-located and they have a distribution network that's centralized, they share the activities because they're going to go to the same places. For example, they're going to carry a lot of their products to the Walmart distribution centers so they can share activities as well. Um, it also talks about cross-selling. Uh, distribution channels. Going back to Honda, you can see that Honda sells their motorcycles, their outboard motors, and maybe their jet skis all at the same store. So they have the opportunity to use the same distribution channels and cross-sell their customers. In my example of uh, the landscaping business and the Christmas lights is a perfect example of cross-selling customers. So that's economies of scope. Next comes market power. I'm going to stop here. Join me in a minute on the next tape.